we invite Jonna to get us to get this off? Come on, Jonna. several months in San Francisco. And my first weekend there, I was on a panel on gay and lesbian history. And one of those in the audience uh, was this very tall, imposing blonde. Um, <laughs> and after which she told me that she worked at Modern Times, which was a bookstore run by a left-wing collective, and I should come by. Um, the following Monday, uh, the verdict came down in the trial of Dan White for the murder of Harvey Milk and George Moscone. And White, as many of you probably know, received the lightest possible sentence, and the call immediately went out to assemble at City Hall to protest. Uh, lots of speakers addressed the crowd, and they all urged us to stay calm. Harvey would want us to be peaceful, they said. Uh, then, <laughs> This tall, imposing blonde came to the podium, and Amber's message was clear. You have a right to be angry, she shouted. Uh, what happened was a miscarriage of justice. Let me see your rage. Uh, and the crowd eventually exploded, and windows in City Hall were smashed, and a row of police cars went up in flames. <laughs> We don't blame Amber for that because it was going to happen, but anyway. But the police followed the crowd back to the Castro, and the violence they unleashed was terrifying that night. But through it all, I remember thinking, that woman was amazing, and I want her in my life. Uh, that summer, the Lesbian and Gay History Project launched in San Francisco, and Amber was one of its founders, and we were at several meetings together. Uh, the project organized that summer a panel on the history of the queer community's relationship with police, and Amber and I were both on it. Uh, the event's title was Spontaneous Combustion, <laughs> and when Amber spoke, it felt like the audience might act out the title. <laughs> Finally, after many encounters in group settings, we planned a Saturday breakfast together. We ate, we talked, we left the restaurant, we kept talking. Eight hours and two meals later, we were still talking. And that day-long conversation really launched a friendship that had continued for over 40 years. Uh, we overlapped in New York in the early 80s, uh, and for two glorious years in the 2000s when Amber worked in Chicago. Uh, mostly, though, it was a long-distance relationship. We would connect at conferences like Creating Change uh, and whenever I would come to my hometown of New York uh, to visit. And through those decades, really, our conversation never ended. Uh, in San Francisco that Saturday, a major topic was the Briggs Initiative, which the year before had launched what was probably the biggest organizing campaign that our community and movement had ever seen. And Amber described to me uh, her way, making her way through small communities in Northern California and the Central Valley, engaging in conversation with countless individuals who had never met a lesbian before. Uh, and for this gay guy who had lived his whole life in New York City, with a large queer community around him, I was awed by the courage of this remarkable dyke. We discussed many other things, uh, topics that we never stopped talking about. Uh, the state of the left in our ever more conservative political environment. Uh, our movement's tendency toward respectability and how it drove both of us crazy. Uh, the increasingly conservative sexual politics of what was once a liberation movement. Uh, the class and racial boundaries that many movement organizations would never acknowledge. Uh, and through all these years, as we all know, Amber remained a bold and tireless activist. Uh, 
She arrived in New York just as AIDS was devastating our communities and she plunged into the fight against it. Uh, she worked for the New York City Human Rights Commission, combating AIDS discrimination, uh, then for the gay men's health crisis in New York where she started the first ever lesbian AIDS project. For a time, she was a staffer at NGLTF. Uh, she pioneered in queer aging issues at the Howard Brown Medical Center in Chicago. Um, and for years, uh, her last sort of big thing was that she directed Queers for Economic Justice, uh, one of the few LGBTQ organizations that recognized how class oppression impacted the lives of queer folks. Um, and Amber always managed in her activism, and I want to quote here, to say out loud what everyone has agreed not to notice. Uh, she was always asking, whose gay battles to survive will be remembered and prioritized? She always called for a new revolution that included the sexual desires that so many people experienced with shame. Amber insisted, and many of you know her book, that we embrace our most dangerous desires and fight for a world that values human sexual possibility. She strove to create a movement willing to live the politics, as she described it, of sexual danger in order to create a culture of human hope. And I and so many others um, will never forget her bold, her daring, and inspiring work. And most of all, perhaps, uh, the smile, the laughter, and the hugs uh, as she called us all sweetie, <laughs> that kept our spirits high even in times that often seem desperate. So uh, rest in power, Amber. I and others will never forget you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be in a room, most of you I don't know, but in a room of people who loved Amber. Um, my name is E.G. Crichton, and I first met Amber either end of 1971 or beginning of 1972. And up until about 15 minutes ago, I was questioning whether I had indeed met her at a meeting of lesbians that was organized to write a chapter for the Our Bodies, Ourselves book that, that the Boston Women's Health Collective was, was putting together, had already put together. And we had protested their exclusion of any kind of queer content. So, but I really wasn't sure, did I really meet Amber in that meeting? And I just ran into Marla 15 minutes ago who said, yeah, Amber was there until she walked out after <laughs> five minutes. Um, furious about class issues. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, thank you for clar clarifying that. <laughs> Amber, at that time, uh, had just come down from Canada. She'd been doing, um, I think Toronto, had been doing anti-war organizing. She was, had, was in love with a woman named Laurel who was straight, um, so it never got became sexual. She arrived in, in Boston with a kind of um, upswept ponytail bun. And in 1972, that was not considered the lesbian um, <laughs> outfit. Uh, so, <laughs> so Amber was different from, from the get-go. Um, and um, the other thing I really remember is uh, we, we were lovers for about five minutes. This is before either of us had, had started using the word femme, which is an identity that Amber helped me come to terms with. Um, but um, she visited me and also stayed in my apartment in Cambridge. Uh, and one time when I was away, uh, I came back and she had decorated my entire apartment. <laughs> I, I think I had just moved in and she had bought little, really sweet little posters and things and everything was hung at 45 degree angles, it was like. Um, so it was this totally presumptuous act, but, but 
totally loving. It was like um, there was a generosity to it that, and we we really became good friends. We bonded around uh, class consciousness, around lefty. We'd both been active in anti-war issues, um, and we just um, we shared two or three butch lovers, not at the same time, but in <laughs> sequence. And we, we spent, Amber was obsessively analytical, I mean, um, wildly analytical. And we would talk for hours about breakups, falling in love, um, the stranger we just passed, you know, something she had cooked. Um, she had the gift of gab in, in the most incredible way. And, um, and she was an amazing cook. She was, I don't know how many of you ever experienced that, but she, I still have a memory of a late night lamb dinner. I think, this is in, in San Francisco, I think it was for Christmas, and she was with her, her lover Paula, who is now Paul, and um, she cooked this elaborate roast lamb dinner, and it wasn't ready until midnight. <laughs> but, but we all, uh, I, I still drool when I think of that, that dinner. Um, Amber also introduced me to sex work and sort of the lighter end of it in terms of um, topless dancing in Boston and outskirts. And both of us made our way to San Francisco about six months apart. Um, on the funds that we earned doing that work. Um, we uh, were in a number of political groups. Some of them were, were really um, um, righteous, and some of them were far less than righteous. Um, some of them were embarrassing to even talk about. We were in a prison group at once of six of us that went into a prison in Connecticut and on the heels of some kind of Harvard study. And we all just, you know, we just tried to organize these women around lesbian stuff and bring them lesbian books. And you know, they, this, this was not what they were interested in <laughs> at the time. So, um, so, um, you know, I just, I, I miss Amber. I miss her intense love, her, um, her kind of wildly imaginative storytelling. You know, nobody I knew ever knew, did she, did, was that really true? Did she really <laughs> do that? Um, so when I thought about what to say about her today, I thought, well, in Amber's tradition, I shouldn't worry too much about the truth. <laughs> um, the, the last time that I saw her, I, I've actually missed Amber for almost a decade, and this has to do with living on two coasts, but it also has to do with the tragedy of her disability and the way that, um, that she mourned being able to enjoy retirement, um, you know, between her broken femurs and her diabetes. And so she isolated herself, and that was um, hard for me. But when we got together, it was always, uh, usually at her apartment, it was always just talk, talk, talking and laughing and, um, you know, like old times. The, the last time I saw her, it was over a hospital bed that Jeffrey Escoffier was in a coma in, and this is about a year and a half ago. And Amber and I met at the hospital, and we old friends with Jeffrey. The three of us had had countless dinners in New York restaurants where we closed the place down, just, you know, talking about ideas and plans that we never did. And, uh, and Jeffrey was, in, was sadly in a coma, and Amber and I read to him, we sang to him, we talked, talked to him, we talked with each other, and it was a very intimate moment that I'm really thankful um, that I shared, and that that's one of my, my final memories of Amber. Um, so anyway, I, I miss her, and I know you all do too, and thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Devanuj, Devanuj Dasgupta, radical femme bottom. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, presently, my day job, 
through which I sponsor my fashion is at, the, at a feminist studies department somewhere <laughs> um, by the Pacific Ocean. So I often dream about Amber um, most of the time, not, not because she's no longer in this world with us, but there, I have Amber, what I call Amber moments. Like I have to call her or commune with her, you know, or, and I can imagine in my dream or in my daydream, you know, her hair, you know, silver blonde hair flipping, you know, her big earrings, the hoop, silver earring hoops. And I'm telling me, well, sweetie, darling, I don't think that's how it should be. Or laughing and asking me, what do you think it is, you know? So one of those instances recently showed up, you know. Um, there are young women on my campus, women queer, bi, non-binary women of color on my campus who are on a hunger strike demanding the reopening of the multicultural center that has been shut down because of their support of the, Palestine, of the cause of Palestine liberation, right? Um, and I've been going to some of the meetings and I came out of one of the meetings in very amber style, raging, wanting to call her. Can you believe these Neiman Marcus Marxists? What the fuck talk in these campuses? No idea of real life organizing. I really wanted to call and like bitch with her because Amber has the art of what we consider bitching into converting it into social critique. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I mean, I think, I think it's quite, uh, it's the Amber Holliber style of critique that I try to teach as a teacher to my students. Um, and I recently taught her book. But before I get to that, I do want to say, so I asked her in my dream, I went to a couple of the meetings, and the Neiman Marcus Marxists kept talking about you know, liberation, and I wanted to say, but the young women, and the queer non-binary folks who are doing hunger strike have come to you with an intersectional black feminist trans queer analysis that's way beyond what you and I teach or you think about at this moment, right? But I walked away, I said, I'll keep quiet, you know. And then the young women reached out to me, one of them, because I was working with them on a campus-wide project around um, doing abolition what does abolition look like in the everyday? And, you know, she reached out to me and I went to them and below, underneath her pillow, she showed me she had a copy of Amber's book. And she pointed out a paragraph that I had taught of Amber's from one of her conversations with Laura Flanders. And Laura, you, you're here, I see you. Your um, interviews with her are amazing pedagogical tools. And she pointed out the power of a political vision is deeply engaged with how you can live out the liberation that you seek and part of that vision is the erotic. Sexuality as a profound component of how people are oppressed and how people dream. Dream is where I often try to meet you, Amber. These days and during the pandemic when we couldn't meet, the last time we talked in person was when I had to go, when I went to give her informally the news about um, the Kessler Award. And, you know, she got the phone call from me. She called me back and said, girl, darling, is this real? Are they going to change their mind? Because I don't want to talk to John or other people if it's not real, you know? Like, you guys are not going to take this back. I said, no, Amber. Um, and in my phone call with her, my last long phone conversation was around E.G. Crichton when you were talking about the passing of Jeffrey Escoffier. But the very last bitchcraft Amber Holiba social critique mode was after a, a webinar that... Margot Weiss, Joseph Donica, and myself had co-organized as a part of bringing together Kessler awardees. And it was her and Urva Shived and Dean Spade. 
And um, when it was going on, I mean, at that time, I was kind of already knowing this was one of the last times we were hearing Urvashi in public, but I didn't think of Amber. And I was in India, it was 4 a.m. India time. Her and I had a long phone call after the call, after the webinar, and we bitched about how the sex phobia of the movement, you know, um, people. So as a teacher, I wanna just talk a couple of things about how Amber helps me today as a teacher in the classroom in a feminist studies department by the ocean. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, for Amber, she gives me a materialist interpretation of desire. Yeah, I read Judith Butler's Subject of Desire. I read The Luz and Guatari, but Amber shows the students what theory in flesh is, what desire is felt, expressed, organized, practiced, looks like. Because you can talk about subjects of desire by a certain author, to young undergrads who are questioning their sexualities or for the first time figuring out a way to write about their immigration status and their identities. But Amber really shows them a world where hope, desire, and pleasure refuses to put profit before people, as well as refuses a Marxist prescription of revolution or what that might be. So as a teacher, thank you, Amber, for helping me with these two important rejoinders, Amber has sent us into the world as a desiring subject, seeking to write a theory in flesh of trans queer refugees, in my case, whose lives are torn apart by war, destruction, and sexist, homo, transphobic uh, persecution. The answer to what is happening on my campus or college campus is, lies in knowing that our campuses are not the only site of organizing. With Amber and many of you in this auditorium, I have been part of direct actions, organizing queer refugee asylum rights, and ultimately, she has helped me rewrite, or how to rewrite, or how to tell the story of desire and pleasure um, of queer refugee world making that is filled with friendship, joy, and the ethics of discomfort. As a friend, it is this ethics of discomfort that our friendship has always embodied. I met Amber first, um, I couldn't decide either. It was either at the Class Institute at, Q at um, a Creating Change. I'm thinking it's probably Portland, Oregon, um, or way before that, around these streets, or probably this hall or this auditorium. And I had already read her book. I went to give her a hug. And she gave me a hug that embraced me and made me feel like seen. Seen as a femme, goti, you know, radical politics that was unhappy with no conversations around the intersections of documented or undocumented status. When I was working with, with many of you here, I see Trish. Hi, Trish, haven't seen you in a long time. We were, we were working on um, and issuing a mission statement on a queer vision for immigration justice. You know, that was really helping put practice. So with that, I want to say that Amber, for me, is all about friendship in praxis. Thank you. So I'm, I'm Christian John Lillis, and I think of the people speaking, I, um, well, I'll get to it. <laughs> um, I first encountered Amber on the page. As an undergraduate, I took a feminist political theory class, and we were assigned Thinking Sex by Gail Rubin. That led me to buy a copy of Pleasure and Danger and read Amber's essay, D Desire for the Future. It was 1992. I was the oldest child of a single mother on welfare for most of my childhood and teens. My femininity, my identification with Wonder Woman, and my queerness made me a target for violence from the time I was in kindergarten. 
I was lucky to have a mother whose older brother was gay, who got pregnant with me and had a shotgun wedding, and whose marriage failed when I was five. Her own experiences prepared my mother to raise a feminine queer kid with a modicum of self-respect. I came out in 1989 at the age of 16. AIDS was ravaging the gay community in New York City. I was terrified of sex and desperate for it. I wanted a man to hold me, to desire me, and of course, to love me. Even knowing about safer sex, I had few experiences before and during college. I knew I couldn't discuss my sexual desires even with my friends. We were raised to think sex was bad and gay sex was likely lethal. But reading Desire for the Future unlocked me. Amber's words made me feel like I wasn't alone. She wrote, sexuality is dangerous. It is frightening, unexplored and threatening. Many of us became feminists because we were dykes or we weren't, because we wanted to do it or we didn't, because we were afraid we liked sex too much or that we didn't enjoy it enough, because we had never been told that our desire was something for ourselves before it was an incitement for our partner, because divining our own sexual direction was a radical notion. But looking at the danger and the damage done to us is only part of coming to terms with sex. We should also begin to look at sexuality itself and at what we mean by words like desire, passion, craving, and need. Do we desire what is forbidden? If the forbidden is connected to taboo, how can we resist oppression without destroying our means to excitement? What is the connection between the erotic and danger, the erotic and comfort? Amber's words were a revelation. I'd assumed as a femme I had to be a bottom and therefore shoulder most of the risk associated with sex. I was drawn to two types of men, the working class butch guys I grew up with. They aroused and terrified me. Some brutalized me and some protected me. As a first generation college student, I was also drawn to bookish, quietly masculine men. I loved their intellects and their often gentler sexual personas. But most of the time, the way class had shaped my personality made me too much for them. Again, Amber wrote, sex is not the same for all of us and a movement that is primarily white and middle class or includes those who aspire to middle class values cannot afford to decide who or which femmes are made victims in a sexual system built on class and race mythologies equally as damaging and vicious as the sexist ones. People fuck differently, feel differently when they do it or don't and want sex differently when they feel passion. We live out our class, race, and sexual preferences within our desire and map out our unique passions through our varied histories. These are the differences that move the skin, that explode the need inside and make sex possible. In 2005, I took a job at the National LGBTQ Task Force where Amber was working on queer aging issues. I'd been a fundraiser in the movement for a little while and I'd met some very famous people and some movement leaders. Uh, but meeting Amber was a close second to dancing with Madonna at Sound Factory when I was 17. <clears throat> uh, I was going to try to be serious, but I mean, you just can't. Um, <clears throat> this woman whose words had such an enormous impact on my thinking was now my colleague. We hit it off immediately. Amber was as brilliant on the fly as she was in her writing. Even better, she was tall and blonde with deep red lips that danced around her joyous laugh. I was 32. I had been with my husband for four, with my now husband for four years. He is the quietly masculine type, the yin to my yang. Still, as Amber wrote in the early 80s, quote, I was on the run from my own desires. I was angry and afraid of the feelings that were alive in my body. I felt driven between my wish to be a decent, reasonable gay and an equal, equally powerful wish to throw all my beliefs and upbringing away and explode into my own sexual raving. I thought I would go mad with it. Like women in centuries before me, I feared sexual insanity. Feeling my lust would lead me further and further from the communities I wished would accept me and into the underworld of passion that would envelope me. I was feminine which was anathema in the mask for mask 90s and early 2000s. So I downplayed it, lest even the gay men I worked with see me as overly dramatic or hysterical. But slowly, through conversations with Amber, I embraced my femme identity. 
I had grown up surrounded by strong, powerful women, and I never felt quite like a man. And that's something that Amber validated for me. Uh, I used to joke with her that I tricked my husband into a butch femme relationship. Um, <laughs> he's, we're 22 years later, he's, he's holding on. Um, <laughs> my friendship with Amber endured me leaving the task force. As a friend and intellectual member, she helped me become who I am today a proud, sex-positive femme who sees pleasure as our collective right. I'll end with a final quote from, Danger, with, from Desire for the Future. Um, it's also just wild to me that like, stuff she wrote in the 80s is so applicable right now. It's kind of, it, it shows how far the country has actually gone backwards. Um, Instead of pushing our movement further to the right, we should be attempting to create a viable sexual future and a movement powerful enough to defend us simultaneously against abuse. We must demand that our pleasure and need for sexual exploration not be pitted against our need for safety. Feminism is a liberation movement. It needs to fight with that recognition at its center. Feminism must be an angry, uncompromising movement, movement that is just as insistent about our right to fuck and our right to the beauty of our individual desires. This goal is not an end in and of itself, but a, means but a means which will ultimately determine the future and direction of our desires. As feminists, we should seek to create a desire, I'm sorry, we should seek to create a society limited only by those desires themselves. Rest in power, my friend. Good evening, everybody. Um, so it, it's also uh, for myself, like uh, a lot of what we heard from other, other speakers today, um, hard for me to pinpoint when exactly I met Amber, but it was kind of like, you know, my life before Amber and after Amber, right? So, um, you know, I'll start from, you know, zero, <laughs> uh, you know, AA after Amber. Hi. I'm Kenyon Farrell. Uh, I am a former uh, executive director of Queers for Economic Justice, uh, amongst some other things. Um, but when I met Amber, uh, she just confirmed so many things that I was sort of seeking answers for. Um, I'd moved to New York a few years prior uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I'm from and where I'm now living again and um, grew up in a, a housing project in Cleveland in the 1980s. And uh, as I tell people often, contrary to, you know, sort of popular belief, I grew up in a community where there were queer people around and who were a part of the community and who were part of our extended family. Nobody hid it. There was never, I don't have a story of a time where I didn't know what being gay meant or whatever. Uh, it, you know, so I feel very blessed in that sense. But when I, um, as I grew older and then went to college and then moved to New York uh, and was coming out, uh, you know, or just coming into political work and finding the just obviously whiteness and the just bouginess of, you know, gay politics, um, just feeling very uh, alienated and like I didn't understand what people were talking about. <laughs> like, and so um, meeting Amber, was a real revelation, uh, you know, in that sense that, you know, my experiences as uh, a poor kid growing up, um, although our lives were very different um, in that circumstance, but that I had something to offer, right, to, to this work and to the movement. Um, one of the things that I remember uh, as we sort of started working together, I think the first thing we worked on was the Beyond Marriage Statement, which people may remember. And, um, and then as I got more involved in QEJ and became a staff member, and then even after I left as ED, I remember, um, sh I think shortly before I left as ED, when she was still on the board, we were sitting in a new office that we had moved into on West 24th Street and said to each other, we were just like, you know, who's organizing? So now we're in Chelsea, right? We're in, at the time, you know, the neighborhood. 
And what is happening to the, the, the bar backs in these gay bars or to the, the drag queens or to the strippers in these clubs? And what, what are their wages like, right? Are people stealing their wages? What do we, you know, and what QEJ's role could be in um, helping to organize queer workers, right, in uh, those kinds of spaces and how we could sort of tie that work to the existing housing and homelessness work that we were already doing, the welfare work that we were doing. Um, and then went to shop that around to several funders. And some of you know that Amber went on to do the kind of queer survival economies work, which really grew out of those initial conversations and uh, found no takers among funders, as you probably uh, can imagine. And so when I think about Amber and her uh, impact uh, you know, on the world, some of which folks have already spoken to, the, um, we're now in a sort of queer sense, the, the idea around sort of femmes and femme power is now so central into, in terms of how people are identifying themselves uh, you know, in movement that as far as I know, Amber was really one of the people who helped kind of solidify um, as, a, as a, a, a political identity, right? Um, I think about the fact that we're now in a space where people more readily uh, disclose themselves as sex workers, right, in the context of their political work, right, and what that means to them in that sense. Um, and I think we owe Amber uh, a great debt for those things. And I think that a lot of Amber's work, is, as uh, my comrade and friend Devanush just, just said earlier, um, speaks a lot to where we are now politically. And I think that a lot of the uh, writing and uh, speaking and uh, you know, videos that are now online of Amber uh, really speak to the, the range of challenges that I think that we face. Uh, given that many of us in this room were trying to, you know, kind of fight against the uh, equality juggernaut to think about what would happen to people post a marriage, you know, kind of uh, movement, right? And we're now living through the reality of a queer movement that is ill-prepared to deal with fascism and white nationalism. <laughs> Moving, moving globally, right? Um, we are ill-prepared for the moment. But I do take some, uh, some uh, comfort in Amber's work and in what she left us as a legacy to help us deal um, with the present moment. And so I encourage us as we think about her and her uh, laugh and calling us doll <laughs> and hon and uh, you know her way of, of, of being in the world to also take up that work again and take up her, her writings and take up uh, thinking about sexuality and gender not just as sort of personal identity uh, sort of markers, which is something I fear, frankly, that the queer movement has kind of moved into, even in spaces that are considered themselves left or progressive or whatever, but that these are the things that really can be tools um, to help us remake the world towards more justice. And I thank you, Amber, for that work and that legacy. I really blame you, Christian, for putting me right after Kenyon, but <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm Beck Jordan Young. I introduced myself before. Preparing for today, I sat in my backyard in a chair where Amber loved to sit in the sun. Our house never quite gelled into the radical queer semi-commune of our fantasies. COVID and Amber's declining health threw a wrench in our plans time and again, but it was still our family home. Amber was my older sister, 
in a family configuration that began to take shape almost immediately when we met 37 two short years ago. As I was trying to imagine how I would explain our deep sister bond, certain scenes kept floating to the top, scenes that are familiar from what others have also said. They were full of color and smells, temperature and tastes, feelings and ideas, 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 and food. A lot of beautiful food, countless hours long meals, sometimes uh, in a restaurant that was for years our fanciest treat, Noho Star where I often feared they'd kick us out because our conversations and laughter were so loud and so long, people would move away from us. <laughs> but usually they were meals that we cooked for each other to mutual oohs and ahs and, oh, doll, how did you do this? Countless hours of meetings in the various places we worked and organized together, initially um, for sexual freedom and justice, and then lesbians and AIDS and other queer people and AIDS, street-based uh, drug users and sex workers, queer women's health, queer economic and racial justice projects, CLAGS, and the Barnard Center for Research on Women. And also at the cottage at Cherry Grove, where we wrote and ate and drank, and I puttered around fixing things while she loudly marveled at the fact that I had such butch fix-it skills. But from our first intense conversation in a jail cell in Washington, D.C., after a mass arrest at the Supreme Court where we were protesting the Bowers versus Hardwick decision, I was shocked at what I didn't have to translate for Amber. Never before or since, since have I known another femme, left, queer, incest-surviving, working-class intellectual, although probably there are 20 or 25 in here. <laughs> But it really felt like, how did this configuration happen in another person? So those 17 years my senior, Amber treated me as a peer immediately with seriousness and respect and camaraderie. I know Amber touched many of you in similar ways with the shock of recognition and the hunger to communicate, to connect, to change the world together. And the belief that that was really possible and vital that it wasn't something that was uh, an empty fantasy or naive, that it was in fact the only thing worth doing, the only way worth living. So as I was preparing uh, these comments, I, I thought about who couldn't be here today and who else shaped my thinking partly through and with Amber. And I kept thinking about Dorothy Allison who couldn't be here today, but who um, Amber talked with me about a lot. I know that Dorothy really shaped Amber's thinking and writing. And um, so I went to the foreword that Dorothy wrote to for My Dangerous Desires. And there's a really beautiful passage. The rest of what I'm going to read is Dorothy's words. Um, Dorothy wrote about Amber's deliberate rebellion against shame and fear. She continued, the risk she takes is enormous. This is who I am, she says. This is how I was shaped, and this is the work I have done to sort out all that is strong and valiant about growing up working class, femme, and perverse. This is what perverse really means, to be disobedient to the rule of fear and hatred and shame, to seek one's own definitions and ideals, regardless of what others insist are the limits to what you may want or have. The work Amber has managed over decades of political activism and embattled passion, that work is a gift to all of us. It is also the fulfillment of a promise, a bargain she and I made long ago. I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours, I promised my new friend Amber in a coffee shop in Manhattan more than 20 years ago. What I offered my friend was the dangerous revelation of desire. I began a sentence with, I want, and we both blushed and looked around. I told Amber, I want to write a great book. I want to make a difference. I want to have adventures and take enormous risks and be everything they say we are and not give a damn what anyone says. Amber told me, I want to live in this scary city and do everything they say we do, date famous, gorgeous, strong women, and wear outrageous clothes, and carry it all off with such a sense of style they don't even see me coming. 
I want to make movies and write articles and speak to academics without fear, or at least not let them see that I'm afraid. I want to tell secrets, I said. Yes, Amber said. We looked at each other for a while. Then we laughed and wiped tears out of our eyes, ordered more coffee, and shifted to safer topics, sexual techniques and butch girls we had dared to use those techniques to enthrall. <laughs> For us, the topic of lust was less dangerous than those desires we had just addressed. Saying, I want, and meaning it, was more dangerous for us than naming our various sexual adventures. Revolutions begin when people look each other in the eyes, say, I want, and mean it. We meant it. That's the wrong program. Here we go. <laughs> no, that's not it. Okay. Here it is. Okay. So next, we're going to just take a short pause in the, uh, in the comments, and we're going to show a beautiful video that Rodrigo Brandel created just for today. The women's movement, it's hard to look back and remember how radical that movement was now that it's feminism and it's all spiffed out and intellectually framed and taught. But there was no, there were no gender studies courses. There were no, there was nothing about that in the world when the women's movement began and for me, I resisted it for quite a while because I really didn't like other women and I really didn't like myself, but I didn't know that because I'd been a powerful activist, revolutionary, leftist, civil rights activist, but I felt guilted into going to the to a women's consciousness raising group and it was shocking I, I nobody was doing anything fancy people were sitting around in a circle talking about life experiences and what what they thought about being female and what had happened to them in their lives and i started to hear it in a way that got underneath the way that I disliked being female. And it was astounding to me. I, I, I just remember thinking, I, I can't believe what's been done to women. I can't believe what's been done to me. And I don't even know how to think about this because it's so huge. And so I became a person that was really involved in the beginnings of the women's movement, um, which was very complicated to try and be a part of because the, the broader movements, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, whatever, completely dismissed women's liberation. And if you were a person that then, if you were a woman that then challenged the kind of leadership around these issues, you were just laughed out of the room or it was even more hostile. I mean, it was ugly to try and make an argument for what happened to women, what was occurring to women. And it was always displaced. Well, what about class? What about race? What about whatever? 
and I, I felt really um, both exhilarated in my own self because it was so illuminating to me about how I'd been raised and like I have a very complicated relationship with my own mother who was dirt poor but she was also violent and beat me and so I never I think it's one of the reasons I felt so strongly about not liking women not trusting women and I began to understand what had happened to her. It didn't make what she had done any less, but I began to understand our poverty in a different way. I began to understand what it meant for women to never be allowed to have dreams, what it meant to really not have the capacity to build a life that might resemble what you want. All you could do is get married. And I was a dyke. I mean, I was queer, and I, I really didn't know what to do with that. Feelings are powerful things, and we should unleash that power more often. That was the teaching of the late, great, queer, working-class femme activist and author Amber Hollabaugh. I've interviewed Amber on this program, and she had a great story to tell about the night after the verdict came down in the case of the killing of Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk in San Francisco for their support of the gay community. The crowd was furious there in the Castro and several high-placed politicians were trying to keep a lid on that anger. Amber, when she got the mic, said, let it out. We have a right to be angry and we should feel that anger more often and act on it. Amber talked about feelings both angry and passionate, about our longings and what it means when we stuff away our feelings and what we long to bring into the world. No political movement can avoid the reality of desire in its midst. Every office building is full of the illicit affairs, the pre unwanted pregnancies, the crises that happen in human lives. For a political movement to not understand that sexuality is a profound component of both how people are oppressed and how people dream, is to not recognize the reality of political power and where it's centered. If I'm fighting for the possibility of having a kind of desire and possibility that right now is not too likely, it gives me a different kind of engagement with the future than, than if I say, oh, well, sex doesn't matter, it's private. Well, sex may be private in the way that you make love, but it's not private in the context of the world we live in. We're targeted as LGBTQ people because we make people nervous around sex, and we practice desire or have the possibility of practicing desire in magical and very, very profound ways. We shouldn't be giving up the possibility of articulating the, the claim of our body and the claim of our desire as something distinctive and erotically profound. So women's, the women's movement transformed my life. I mean, it really transformed my life. I began to think very differently. I stopped doing things like making fun of myself. I stopped thinking jokes about women were funny. I stopped, and I began to do really serious work with working class women. I was doing a lot of anti-war work against the Vietnam War, and I began to work with a lot of women that were in the army um, because that was the kind of background I came from and I knew I could do that kind of work. I mean, I started doing that kind of work with sex workers, work with the kind of women that the women's movement didn't actually want at the table, frankly, and were very nervous about, even though everybody believed in sisterhood, but sisterhood in reality versus sisterhood theoretically, that was something else. So that, that was a problem. <laughs> I was so saddened to hear of Amber's death at this time when we need our comrades more than ever. And Amber was a fierce, femme, brave comrade. 
I hadn't seen her in many years, but her spirits, our spirits communicated. Um, and I join you all in saying that her work and her spirit and her insights into class and gender and sexuality will live on in our battle for queer freedoms and anti-fascism work. Oh, I'm so honored to spend just a couple of moments thinking about Amber and all that I love about her. I've been thinking about how, even though she wasn't a religious person, she always called me Rev, and how she was perhaps one of the most reverent people I know in the sense of sucking the marrow out of life in, in honoring the full humanity of people in her absolute glee when she t tilted her head back and laughed. I am thinking about um, how she was ferociously herself always and had such a fabulous combination of not suffering fools lightly, but also showering you with love and affection. I think about how she was such a role model to me of someone who maintained her brilliance and her passion for intersectional justice making in ways that some people lose that passion as life goes on. And Amber was passionate to the moment, uh, to the last moment that I saw her. And I think about the breakfast that we had at Creating Change a number of years ago after she broke her femur and uh, how we talked about life and death and disability. And I just had a car accident six months ago that almost killed me and pretty significantly injured my leg. And I think about that conversation with Amber, and I hope that I am uh, responding to what happened to me with the same amount of chutzpah and passion that Amber has responded to the pieces that happened in her life. So I love you, Amber. I will do my best to keep up the work that we shared, sending so much love and prayers and blessings. It's impossible to capture the scope of Amber in a few moments. I just know that her life represented that rare quality, authenticity. Her words, writing, her very presence were a relief in this crazy world. When I think of queer survival, and I think of it a lot, I think of the brilliance of Amber. She understood and understood deeply our gorgeous precariousness. Her courage to never look away, to name what so few would or could name, was a beacon for me personally and also for my community. Her words provided the relief of truth and insight that I have so needed time and again. Amber was a beautiful soul. Hey guys, just uh, wish I was there with you all uh, in the uh loving Amber today. I'd like to tell a quick story uh, about her compassion and her fortitude and just her love of community and helping people. So QEJ had a, a trans girl in the shelter system uh, that had never been to a prom because uh, she couldn't go as she wanted to go as herself. And I put a call out uh, telling pe people the story and Amber answered and got this woman, this young lady, a gown, shoes, makeup, hair, and off she went uh, and took it to the prom, you know, to a prom at the center. And I ran into her years, years, years later, and uh, she still talks about it. It was one of her highlights of her life, and Amber made that happen. She helped this woman uh, 
that just wanted to be happy and be herself. I loved working with Amber. You know, it was uh, trying, <laughs> you know, because Amber could be a little stubborn at times, you know. Uh, but, you know, the conversations we had around policies and anyway, I only have two minutes. I love you, Amber. Always have. We'll miss you. This earth, this community is going to miss you. But, you know, I'm not a religious person, but. If there is something somewhere, I know that you're up there organizing. I know you're up there making sure that everyone is at the fucking table, that no one is ever left out because that's what you believed in, that we all are together in this. Uh, hello, I'm Felice Picano, and I'm honored to be part of Amber's memorial service. I'd seen Amber around at various political events for some years, especially in San Francisco. I knew Jennifer from being writers together when there really weren't that many of us openly gay and lesbian writers. And of course, through via mutual friends. Jen reminded me that it was in different like bookstore on Hudson Street in the village that I saw the two of them and introduced them to each other. Not long after I was living in California and Jen called and asked if my guest loft in the Hollywood Hills was available for a period of a few days. It was and that it was then that Jen and Amber arrived for a slightly delayed honeymoon. I was delighted to be part of that. The three of us then drove up in my little teal colored rice rock up the coast to San Francisco where they finished the trip. Amber was involved in <clears throat> AIDS work about the same time that I was um, on, the, on the West Coast. <clears throat> and then when she came to New York, she got involved in GMHC's lesbian outreach and lesbian AIDS um, work for the, for the group. Very important work that nobody else was doing. I went around, in fact, I went around with my sister-in-law who was sick, straight woman who was sick. Around that time, we were going to high schools um, and private schools talking about uh, women with AIDS. <clears throat> the, all, <clears throat> the all too well knowing, slightly mischievous looks that Amber could give you in a group was absolutely unique to her. Among her many accomplishments was leading sometimes in front and sometimes from within. It's an art. We miss you, Amber. Amber was a great stepmom. She started to describe, I guess, and express um, the type of impact that she had on our life when I did my best. Uh, all I know is she was very kind to us and to me, my brother. Uh, she was a great partner to my mom. My, uh, she was always there for us just as a family sweet, kind, gave me uh, constructive criticism, uh, but it helped me really push and evolve to the person and the man I am today. Uh, I will always remember those times at the little beach house, Cherry Grove, um, where her memory will always live on. Another great memorable moment about her, it's her love for football. Uh, I loved it too, didn't matter what game it was, she'd always be watching. Uh, didn't matter the team, <laughs> we'll always be watching football. So whenever it was on any pro football game on, we'd be, we'd be sharing those moments together. And those are always moments that I will cherish and never forget. Amber was a great stepmother and a great friend growing up. She was, she always had advices for me and I will truly miss her fish vindaloo. This is Josephine Ho coming to you from the Center for the Study of Sexualities, National Central University, Taiwan. Many years before Amber visited with us, we had already been reading and teaching her work. In 2013, we finally succeeded in bringing her to Taiwan, and again in 2015. On both visits, we made her work. She gave keynote speeches at our conferences. 
she headed panel discussions with local leftist queer sex work activists. She came to our classes and talked to our students. On all of these occasions, we were all touched by her passion and her vigor. I'm happy to report that we were fortunate in keeping a record of all her talks in Taiwan, transcribing them and translating them and making them available on our website. We had a great time together. She was like a big sister to all of us and a great role model for all. We will always remember her fondly. I met Amber Hollabaugh in the late 70s um, at a gay and lesbian socialist salon that John D'Amelio organized on the Upper West Side. She was visiting uh, New York from San Francisco where she'd been working against the Briggs Initiative. And I, my breath was just taken away. Amber in an army jacket and combat boots and just full of so much energy. What Amber's gift to all of us has been that she brings together sex radical politics with class politics, with LGBTQ politics, with anti-racist politics in a way that has helped create a, a political formation that's vital to my political life and has been vital to the best of the queer left um, over the past several decades. I don't know how we would be uh, the best of what we are today without Amber Hollabaugh. Greetings, I'm Barbara Satin, former Faith Works Director with the National LGBTQ Task Force, now retired. Amber Hollabaugh was an amazing individual, a mentor as well as a friend who gave me the energy and the vision and the focus for my 30 plus years of LGBTQ activism. She was the guiding light that helped me see that my oldness, my transness, and my deep faith were strengths rather than weaknesses, assets rather than debits, to having a positive impact on a world that had little time for old people, were ignorant about gender identity and expression, and saw spirituality primarily as a weapon to be used against others. Amber's impact was significant on so many individuals and groups, but for me, she was the leader who shined the light on the dark, largely unexplored world of aging for queer communities. Her seminal work, Outing Age, was the Bible that many of us read cover to cover and used to help us inform our peers about the issues they faced as they age, while also giving us tools and valuable information to assist legislators, administrators, regulators, and senior care providers who are willing to respectfully serve old, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans folks. As you can tell, Amber has changed my life in many ways. Because of Amber's loving counsel and that of others who saw the truth and beauty in what I have to offer, I approach my 90th birthday with satisfaction for what I have accomplished, but discontent with where we currently are as a country. I expect that satisfaction and discomfort were the fuels that burn brightly in Amber's fruitful life. Amber, you are missed but not forgotten. Thanks for all you have done for so many people and for me, with love, Barbara.
In butch femme relationships, one of the dynamics that's really important is that femmes love what butches have been denigrated around. We love that they are in their bodies the way that they are. We love the masculinity up against the being female. We love the fact that they don't take any crap. We like how they drive. You know, I mean, it's really, it's like, and we give that to our lovers. We get, that is part of what's so profound, I think, in butch femme relationships is that we love the place that's been so hurt and so punished. And we want the place that they've had to try and figure out how to deny sexually. We want who they are. We want that desire. We want that fierceness. We want somebody who's not going in soft. We want somebody who wants to take us apart and put us back together. And we want them and their capacity to do that with us. So part of the comfort in a way is that we, fi we find them beautiful. I mean, I I have always found butch lovers just irresistibly stunning and complicated and erotically exactly who I want to be with. And they want me. And they want me in a way that I'm me having built my femininity, not because I'm feminine, but because I actually have, it's like being a drag queen. I have created the way that I'm a femme and it's not like my mom. It's not like straight girls. It's like, don't get confused and don't get in my way. So somebody's got to want to love me back that big and not be intimidated by the way that I bring my feminist to a relationship. Thank you, Rodrigo, for that gift to all of us. So, my name is PJ Starr, and I am coming to you from the horse. Uh, I'll start out by saying, our dearest friend, Amber, has ascended to wherever the greatest whores go, and as other speakers have noted, is organizing there. Shamus Outlaw, K 
Carol Lee, Cecilia Gentili, Gabriella Lecce, Lorena Borjas, and so many more. And now, Amber Hollabaugh. As long as there is breath in my body, I will raise your image, Amber, in Sex Worker Rights. You were a great filmmaker, writer, an excellent whore. Uh, and in a small way, in my orbit, or my orbit is small, <laughs> Amber's impact was great. Um, you did something amazing for me and my co-director, Erica, who's down there in the audience, which was be an advisor to the very end of our trans and sex worker-led space, which is called BPPP. Without Amber Hollabaugh, there would be no BPPP. She was there for so long and was there for us, and we honor her. What you, Amber, added to our understanding of um, sex worker rights is the following. It that is that sex workers are and sex work is everywhere. You recognize sex workers in all the workplaces. Many conversations we had, Home Depot, Walmart, NYU, any university when you think about it. But she would always say to me, it is not my job to speak their experiences. It is what they must do. And I am ready, willing, and waiting to support them when they claim who they are. And it may not be now, or it may not be soon, but eventually it will come, and I'm ready and waiting. You recognized, Amber, the risk in outing ourselves as sex workers. And that's something that you know, a little bit tenuous to talk about it, but there is a risk. When the book, My Dangerous Desires, came out, Amber shared with me that because it said something to the effect of prostitute on the back cover or sex worker, I can't remember which term was used, that when she was interviewed for, uh, in, re in regards to that book, all interviewers focused on was, tell me about your experience as a prostitute. Tell me about that. All of her experience, and this is something we talked about a lot, was flattened externally to you are just the whore. That is who you will always be. You can't be anything else. But we all know that Amber was completely intersectional and so much more involved in every movement. But those words on the back cover meant that when interviewed, that was all she could be. Painfully, Amber knew that it wasn't only the media that tries to clip the wings of sex workers in this way. It's everywhere, uh, in social movements, in university classes, in organizations, in feminist groups. No matter where we go, when it is revealed in some way that we are the whores, that is all we are allowed to be, nothing more. When we stand and when Amber stood side by side with many academics or straight people with jobs, I don't know, people with, people with paid employment, she would be doing the exact same thing, the exact same thing in human rights circles, the exact same thing, but almost always unpaid. And that is the heart of horse stigma, that you don't trust the horse with money and you don't trust whores to be paid, and whores are maybe not worthy of being paid. I have some great news. We can end this today by taking out our cell phones and donating to one of the, one of the many causes that Amber supported. It starts with us. We have Cash App, PayPal, all the rest. All of this money is accepted by sex worker rights advocates. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, but why just me? What about the state? What about those billionaires? Don't worry, sex worker rights activists have a plan to get money from the state and redirect it to the programs that are needed and are in fact doing that right now. And it has been a long-term goal of sex workers since as long as we've known to take the money from the billionaires and give it to the people in need.
And if I may say something personal about myself, Amber was very pleased for me that I had a doctorate and said, you made it. You got a doctorate. You have the golden ticket to get in. And she felt that I was going to get a great job earning a lot of money. I never had the heart to say what affected her also affected me. Doesn't matter how good you are. They don't give you the paid job. So, but we can turn that around, right, with our phones. So what did Amber do in the face of all of this? It's already been spoken about. Thank you so much, Kenyon, for, your, for mentioning this in great detail. Uh, she started QEJ, Q's Queers for Economic Justice, because that's where it starts. It starts with us. When we bid farewell to a sex worker luminary, the whore luminary, such as Amber, we don't have to worry about giving a donation. Where will the money come from next week? Don't worry, Amber's got you covered. Uh, that's the incantation. <laughs> excellent, excellent whore Amber. I, they, they called you a challenge. You never were that for me. But thank you if you were ever an irritant or you were ever difficult. You kicked white supremacy's ass. You addressed the pain. You had a giant heart and we had times. You taught me to be okay with having grown up poor and to be myself. I carry you with me every single day. Rest in power, Amber Hollabaugh. Hello. Hello, I'm Eli Claire. I'm so happy to be here, so sad to be here. I realize that what I'm about to read is actually not true, that I came really close to meeting Amber in 1987 before the Supreme Court civil disobedience, but so I'm telling this truth already. I first met Amber from afar at the 2002 Queer Disability Conference in San Francisco. Oh, I knew who she was, and I was entirely starstruck. As one of the small handful of organizers of that event, I was moving much too fast to say hello. Or so I told myself. In truth, my shyness took over. But I did watch her at the edge of those rooms, listening, taking notes, listening some more. She could have easily inserted herself as a dyke organizer, a well-known writer and HIV AIDS activist. But she, but she didn't. Instead, she sat absorbing, learning, making both personal and political connections, practicing solidarity. Not long after, Amber and I actually met 
and like many of the folks who, who have said this before, from that very first moment, we were talking for hours upon hours upon hours. Over the next 20 plus years, wherever we found ourselves, conferences and corporate hotels, Starbucks, all that beloved Starbucks that became, became another office for her. The QEJ offices, we would talk nose to nose. I will miss her laugh, her smile, her snark, the unfolding of stories, truth, and analysis between us. She saw my genderqueer, mixed, mixed class, rural, misfit, survivor self so, so well. Again and again, I found her support and solidarity around disability organizing and politics. She knew deeply and often personally the connections between disability and poverty, disability and aging, disability and HIV AIDS, disability and isolation. In her last years, we tried to see each other repeatedly and failed. Our relationship turned to intermittent texting. In our last exchange, weeks before her death, I sent her a poem from the book I'm finishing up, and she promised we'd see each other soon. Here's the poem I sent Amber. It's called Love Notes. We may not survive the decade, much less century. Yet, when deluge descends, this time and this time and this time, surface erupting in silver fairy, we invite each other down to the murky bottom. Fill our ears, throats, bellies with the stories we need most. Swim among sunken trees and drowned rivers. Join the loons, dive for our next meal. Find love notes buried in the muck. Amber loved so many of us in this room. She left hundreds, if not thousands, of love, of love notes buried in the muck of this world. Sweet notes Tender notes, flirty notes, vulnerable notes, fierce notes, challenging notes, risky notes. She left so many love notes buried in the muck of this world. We carry so many of her love notes with us. Amber. Wherever you are now, I have no idea. Wherever you are now, thank you for your love, your solidarity, your femme ferocity. May your memory be a revolution.
Hello, you beautiful people. My name is Beth Zemsky, and we've had so many incredible speakers so far talking about Amber the Revolutionary, Amber the Activist, Amber the Writer, Amber the Dreamer. And I want to do instead is talk, Amber, talk about Amber as the friend. So in addition to a passion for sexuality, as many of you know, Amber had a passion for connection. Among Amber's many talents was making unlikely or not innately apparent connections. She connected people, ideas, communities, and issues. I never actually asked Amber why she was so connected with me despite our differences. I was white, middle class, Jewish lesbian from Long Island, who now lives in Minnesota and has lived in Minnesota the entire time I knew Amber. And how come this raised poor Roma woman, working class from Central California connected so deeply with me? But shortly after we met, I knew there was something deep and inescapable in our connection. I was in Amber's sphere and she was deeply in my heart. I first met Amber in 1988 at a lesbian and gay health conference. I was doing a session on same gender domestic violence and she of course was doing a session on sex work. Our first connection unbeknownst to me at that point was Amber talking to somebody who had been publicly known as an HIV activist and a sex radical who was actually a really, really shy butch who wanted, for some reason I still don't quite understand, to connect with me and have a hookup. So Amber spent a number of hours after this conference convincing this sh really shy butch to actually go ahead and hook up with me. <laughs> so let me just ask you, in Amber's pursuit for human sexuality, how many of you experience Amber the Yenta? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. So because of the unlikely connection that Amber made for me at that conference that lasted over two and a half years, and I have to say was one of the most passionate and transformative connections of my life, a connection that also supported me during the two years where my twin, bro twin brother was sick and dying of AIDS. It was because of Amber making that connection that my life was transformed. Amber was also a tremendous support for me during those years as I flew back and forth between Minneapolis to New York, helping me make the emotional as well as physical journey through my brother's illness and the impact of HIV on my life with every trip across the country that I made. Over time, all of my partners had to actually pass the Amber test. <laughs> the Amber test was, were they able to hold their own with Amber and did they open the door for her? Amber schooled more than one of my partners into being a better butch. As with many of you, one of the ways Amber and I connected was around activism. In 1997, when Amber was working at GMHC, Amber spent a week with me in Minneapolis as we co-created a curriculum for lesbians and HIV. She had just begun her relationship with Jen shortly before this trip. I still smile when I think about how Amber would completely lose her cool whenever it was time for a call with Jen. She would squirrel away into the other room in my house and for an hour at least be rolling with giggles that filled my home. It was a joy to witness Amber falling in love and to watch that love grow and blossom over the years into ever deeper connection that filled her heart and supported her work in the world. As a friend, Amber was kind, inquisitive, generous, and yeah, sometime a complete handful. <laughs> Part of Amber's passion for connection manifest when she saw something in people and then advocated for others to see that as well. For me personally, I know that Amber pushed for my inclusion in projects like Building a Queer Left and the group that created the same-sex marriage statement. I know I wouldn't have been there without Amber. The, that quality, seeing the potential in people and advocating for them to be in situations where people saw that potential as well, was one of her relational gifts and was on display constantly in her connections at the task force through the aging and faith work and throughout her time at QE Day. With all of Amber's brilliance, passion, and yeah, divaness, 
What deepened and sustained our connection was her, our, her vulnerability, the vulnerability that was underneath the towering strength she showed to the world. It was this vulnerability that I heard weekly, sometimes daily, during phone calls during her time with, at QEJ, and frequent conversations during her time at the task force, and later after her formal work in the movement was done. During one very memorable trip to Minnesota after her first devastating fall and broken femur, we held a retreat in the North Woods, me and our friend Rebecca the Rev, who is here today, to support her through her uncertainty and fear that she wouldn't find another way to engage her passion and feel relevant in the movement and movements that she loved. The last time I saw Amber in person was in 2019, shortly before the pandemic. This is actually my first trip to New York since the pandemic. I had a multi-hour layover at Kennedy, during which I zipped over to Brooklyn for a visit with Amber and Jen. After her falls and other health crises, Amber was already beginning to isolate, but she was still willing to let me in. I'm incredibly grateful for that time. The last few years were difficult for Amber, for Jen, for many of us who are, who are living in a, um, for many of us, and we, there are still many, many challenging times ahead, many of which Kenyon talked about earlier. The last few years were difficult. In Jewish tradition, we say the Morna Kaddish, not for the dead, but for those of us who are living and are still living and hold a piece of our loved ones after they have departed. In this way, they live through us. I will hold the lessons that I learned for Amber about the primacy of passion and connection across difference, people, ideas, community, space, and time. Amber lived a full and passionate life. And from Amber, I learned a number of things, including that we must follow our passions without hesitation or we'll end up following our hesitations without passion. Thank you, my friend. We'll get to that knee replacement someday. <laughs> Joseph D. Philippus was one of Amber's dearest friends. He was the, the visionary founding executive director of Queers for Economic Justice. And from its very beginning, Amber was a foundational, devoted, essential generator of QEJ's groundbreaking work. As a spokesperson, a board member, a galvaniz galvanizing organizer, and finally as ED. Joseph and Amber worked hand in hand, filled with mutual love and admiration for all of QEJ's history. Joseph is now a professor at Seattle University. He flew in from the West Coast a couple of days ago so he could speak today, and then he got COVID. He is heartbroken at not being able to be with us today to honor and remember Amber in beloved community. We wish him a rapid and full return to good health. These remarks are his remarks. <laughs> We do our best. Amber was my beloved friend, and I could talk about that friendship, but I don't know how to do that in public or how to do it briefly. It is still too hard, and my grief remains raw, even after a few months. But there is one aspect of our friendship that I do know how to talk about. Besides being my friend, she was also my teacher. So much of what I am today was shaped by her and by the many lessons I learned from her. I've been teaching for over two decades now, and I've been teaching full-time for nine years. And in my teaching, I often try to share with my students what I learned from Amber. Sometimes I do that by having my students read Amber's writings or watching interviews with Amber. So today I want to share with you some of the lessons that have been learned by, from Amber by people who have never met her. Here are some quotes. November 2012. My former student, Monica, reflecting on Amber's sex work notes, some tensions of a former whore and a practicing feminist, written in 2000. Amber Hollibaugh's article gave me so much hope. I am inspired by her bravery in criticizing feminists for refusing to defend sex workers. I love when she says there's an enormous hunger for a movement that doesn't want to create a world that's the same as this world and doesn't want to fight for us to be the same as them. 
When she says that, Amber celebrates how some queer people reclaim being the other and the sense of empowerment that can come from rejection of traditional ideals. LGBTQ individuals can look at a world that disapproves of the sex trade and transcend that disapproval on the basis that, as queer people, we already know that the world is certainly not always right. June 14th, uh, June 2014, student Lisa on Amber's 2468, who says that your grandmother's straight from, <laughs> from 2012. For some reason, I had never even considered the issue of queer senior citizens. Halaba discusses the unrecognized population of LGBTQ old people. Here's a community that is marginalized, burdened with the extra complications of how our society perceives these populations. I am so grateful to Halaba for educating me. May 2016, student Addie on Amber's My Dangerous Desires, A Queer Girl Dreaming Her Way Home, published in 2000. Halaba focuses on how a gay liberation movement cannot even exist without sexuality. To quote her, sex is not just an action without baggage, but a reminder of our intense, binary, conformed, and oppressive society. We have been shaped, deformed, and liberated by the forbidden sexuality that we have dared to claim, regardless of the cost, because of that journey, because of paying that price, we know as a lived reality that sex and desire are political." End quote. Halabah's point is so important. Sex is political. We cannot pretend that it isn't. If we disregard sexuality within the queer liberation movement, we disregard the fundamental nature of humans as expression of sexual beings, and we disregard one of the fundamental reasons that we are hated in the first place. Halabah teaches us that by ignoring sex, we cannot win any real victories. June 2018, a student, Paul, on Amber's television interview on The Laura Flanders Show, Amber L. Halabah, The LGBTQ Movement's Radical Vision, which aired in 2013. Ms. Halabah provides a blueprint for future activist work. I learned a lot from her message of querying economic, racial, and gender justice. She really taught me about another perspective on post-marriage queer activism, and it reminded me of how important it is to prioritize poverty and class. For weeks since I watched the video, I have thought every single day about her quote, if you can't do anything but fight for every single solitary thing, every single solitary day, then the privilege of dreaming becomes something that only a few people have. November 2020, student Madison on Amber's Sexuality and the State, the Defeat of the Briggs Initiative and Beyond from 1979. I really enjoyed reading Amber's, Amber Hollabaugh's account of what it was like to be on the ground fighting against the Briggs Initiative in rural communities in California. It was really encouraging to see how after receiving criticism about some of the rhetoric that was being used on the campaign against the bill, the activists changed how they were discussing it. Often we hear about criticisms, but not how these critiques were considered and incorporated into activist practices. I learned a lot from Halabah here about how to be open to critique in my own activism and how that critique can make my activism stronger. April 22nd, student Sarah on again, my dangerous desires. Like Amber Hollibaugh, I sometimes struggled with the balance between my two lives. I feared harsh judgment from people who didn't understand what my world was like. People are biased because of their fear of sexuality and their own rules and gender norms for women. Hollibaugh reframes this and inspires me. If a woman is sexually free, then she cannot be controlled. And finally, from March 2024, student Geraldine also reflecting on the Laura Flanders Show segment from 2013. I learned a lot from all the videos we watched last month, but I was particularly struck by the interview with Amber Hollibaugh. One thing that stayed with me is this quote, I think social change work is some of the most extraordinary dreaming that any of us have the possibility of doing. In some ways, the challenge of staying political is to stay a dreamer at the same time. Everyone's told always that in politics you have to be practical, but I actually think that's not true. 
I think you actually have to hold to a dream and understand what you can execute and what you can move forward. But you never give up on the dream, end quote. I feel like normally this is presented in such binary terms. Either you're a dreamer or you are a pragmatist. And I have struggled with that binary in my own community organizing. I love that Hollabaugh encourages us to be both. It's such important guidance for me as a young person just starting out in my activism. Those words led to a huge light bulb above my head. I wish I could thank her. All of these students' reflections demonstrate that although we have lost our friend, the legacy of Amber's work and her words will live on for years and years. There are still so many more people, people who are not even born yet, who will learn as I did from Amber's big, expansive, thoughtful, strategic, generous vision of a better world. And I am so lucky to have had this brilliant teacher as my dear friend. I will never stop missing her. Those are Joseph's words. Thank you, Joseph, for this inspiring and illuminating tribute. Hi, I'm Laura. I really think it's that time in the program when Amber should just reappear, don't you think? <laughs> Enough of all this. Amber, you trained us to be so conscious of absences, you really did not prepare us to deal with your own. Um, I want to just bring a message from Lisa Dugan, who you saw in the video. She is in another fight with cancer, but um, the odds are looking better today than they did a week or so ago. She would be here. Um, if she wasn't immune suppressed right now. Well, like many of you, I really can't remember when I met Amber. Um, sometime in the late 1980s or early 1990s, somewhere in the tangly swirl of queer left dyke life that sort of substituted for a, mo a movement in late 20th century New York City. As people, we didn't have, and we still don't have, a party. We don't have a prayer book, we don't have a pulpit, um, we don't have a hiring hall, we don't even have a uniform. We don't have any of those things, or even a manifesto that we probably all agree on. What we had then and what we have still, I think, are one another. Pals, comrades, people we recognize, and people we're recognized by. People we care about, people we count on. And to me, Amber was one of those. We weren't what you would call intimate friends, although everything about her I found utterly inspiring. That so much great, good, radical, gleeful stuff could be packed into that one gorgeous, raucous package. I just found the simple fact of her existence brilliant and liberating. If she could so fully be, then couldn't I? And couldn't we? And couldn't we create the complete, complex, compassionate community that she believed was within our reach? If only we would do that reaching. Couldn't we? I interviewed Amber, as you can see, at every opportunity that I could possibly find. Um, about lesbians and AIDS when I was at WBAI, or about the myth of gay affluence when I was at the Media Watch Group Fair, or about the Beyond Marriage Statement, which I signed and also reported on um, from that short-lived experiment that was called Air America Radio, or about survival economics at CUNY TV, or most recently on my public television show. A filmmaker herself, Amber knew and recognized and appreciated the slog involved in making independent media and the exhaustion, which I'm clearly feeling, of bringing things into being that needed to exist and moving from perch to perch and then feeling the sadness of watching good projects go belly up or die for lack of fun or lack of funding. 
In 2011, when I had to stop Grit TV, a daily TV program that I had really poured my heart into, I put on a very good show to the outside world. We don't talk about stopping, we talked about pausing. Um, to our funders, we said we were reconfiguring and, um, you know, we're going to be back any minute. The fact was we were exhausted and fed up and furious. And Amber, I have to say there were two people who saw through my veneer. One was Uncle Alexander, who called me up and said, what's really going on? And the other one was Amber, who also called me up, saw right through it and said, hi, doll, how about breakfast? And so we got into a kind of habit of breakfast once every few months at NoHo Star. <laughs> On Lafayette and Bleecker, it was a place with great people, good oatmeal, and even better pancakes. There, Amber let me moan and groan about how hard everything was. Me, the big optimist, the person whose you know, slogan is, we covered you know, the TV and radio show where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Sometimes, like these days, I've begun to feel we should just change that to the place where the people who say it can't be done were right. Um, <laughs> but anyway, she tolerated my complexity and, and um, you know, contradictions. And she allowed me to moan. And then about a year later, it was her turn when QEJ was forced to close its doors for many of the same, same reasons. She was miserable and furious and raging and funny and fun to be around and determined and still optimistic. And we had more pancakes. I think about Amber and I think about pleasure and danger for all the right reasons, but I also think about desire and disappointment. As much as love, they too make us part of the world. Amber's scholarship and her friendship encompassed all of that. We didn't have to put on a show. Now, in this moment of genocidal war, white nationalism, misogyny, and rising transphobia, it is hard not to feel grief for the world and our dreams for it. Will we ever have this sort of politics? <laughs> that Amber and so many of us have dreamed of and fought for. And that she fought so ardently to bring into being. Will we ever have a, will we ever have a politics that is actually fit to be human in? I think I can still see. <laughs> Adrian Rich um, famously wrote, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. Amber was one of those, and I cast my lot with her and with you anytime. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jennifer Levin, and um, <clears throat> Laura Flanders is uh, came all the way from Adelaide, Australia. <laughs> And um, where she was, and she said, I wouldn't miss this for the world. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you, Laura, and, and, and thank you, everybody who's here. Um, before I start, uh, I, I, we have to give a big thank you to CLAGS um, for, for hosting us here. Thank you. 
at the Graduate Center today and um, for helping us memorialize Amber Holaba. Um, by renaming its Seminars in the City educational program as the Amber Holaba Seminars in the City. Um, and these will launch in the coming year. Um, I, thanks to everyone, by the way, who donated to these seminars so far, and, and a special appreciation to um, the generosity of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Um, uh, where Amber did her final seminal work. Um, and uh, the co-directors of BCRW, Janet Jacobson and Pramila Nadison. Um, big thanks to Rodrigo Brandau for the video we're shown today. Um, Rodrigo worked really hard on that until like four in the morning um, when he dropped of exhaustion and, and I did too, but he put together something really beautiful, so thank you. Um, and I thank him also for recording this event. Uh, the video of this event will be available on the CLAG's YouTube channel in the coming days and I want it to be on every YouTube channel for as many people uh, to see as possible. Um, and thanks to Matt Brim, the beast. <laughs> and, and Christian John Lillis, my fearless femme. <laughs> and Beck Jordan Young, who looks terrible in a tuxedo. <laughs> and Devanush Das Gupta, my fierce femme, for being on the organizing committee and, and organizing just about everything, <laughs> including me. And thank all of you from my heart for being here. Um, I, I think I want to acknowledge uh, how privileged we are in a way to be able to gather openly and mourn someone we love. Um, in history, it's quite a remarkable thing for us to be here now. And for queer people, yes, but for many people, there's many closets, there are many deprivations. Um, and uh, many people all over the world have not been able to do what we're able to do now. Um, so I'd like to take this moment to think of them, all those who cannot mourn openly. And I'm dedicating this moment to them. Uh, let's think of them in silence for just a few seconds. Okay. This is hard and it hurts. But what a woman she was. <laughs> I wrote to a friend recently that um, grief is sort of like a strange territory. Um, this, I feel like I've dropped into an alien land uh, and without a map or a compass, and I have no idea how to navigate it. Um, and uh, those of you who know me or who have traveled around the world with me, uh, who've even wanted to meet me on a street corner somewhere in Brooklyn, know that even in the best of circumstances, I have trouble finding out where the hell I'm supposed to be or how the fuck to get there. Um, so I'm often lost, but... Um, my family and friends are here, um, so I'm not totally lost. There's my demented little family right here. Um, Mac Levin, Van Delorier, Julie Delorier, Mary Ellen Musio, Brianna Zimmerman. Is Mikey Lopez there? Oh, yes, indeed. All these people shower me with unconditional love. And my friends, who are Amber's friends too, and who've kept me from falling apart countless times, uh, Terry Bogus, Beck Jordan Young, Ricky Blum, Katie Taylor, 
E.G. Crichton, Roberta Scholar, Sandra Siegel, John D'Amelio, and others. Uh, as my son said, Amber was a good stepmother. Um, that raising children is not easy under the best of circumstances, and most folks can't afford the best of circumstances, and we were no, no exception. Our family split and reconstituted. I mean, you know, we're human, we're here, we're queer. We love each other, we hate each other, we figure out how to love each other again, get used to it. When Mac and Van were very young, they were playing with some other kids on a swing set. And a girl asked, how many mommies do you have anyway? <laughs> Four, they said. She paused, then said incredulously, you came out of four vaginas? <laughs> Amber was nervous about becoming a stepmom. She worried that because of her own uh, really painful childhood, um, she wouldn't do anything right, and she wouldn't know what to do in the first place. And so I told her, when in doubt, think Auntie Mame. <laughs> it fit, she took that to heart. Next thing I know, she's saying, I'm buying us tickets to Disney World. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> and we went. <laughs> now, Amber was a communist. <laughs> she was a dedicated Marxist. And if there's a special place in hell for Marxists, <laughs> it probably looks something like Disney World. <laughs> I mean, talk about taking one for the team. <laughs> Amber was also an extraordinary partner to me for 26 years. Uh, we're very different. Religion attracts me, I study it. She believed you're born, you die, and in between, if you're lucky, you become a communist. <laughs> uh, but she and I shared um, a, a great love. It was a generous love. Um, in the late 1990s, uh, she attended the Prostitutes and Sex Workers International Conference in Los Angeles and wrote me a long letter. I'm going to read a very small part of it. She said, Ironic that the conference is in LA, so close to Bakersfield and to the California growing valleys I was fleeing. The smells here, the crickets, the outrageous colors of the flowers, so garish and beautiful, all bring me back to my own younger self, a very defiant, angry, terrified teenage lesbian stripper. Freeways, and motorcycles, and men three times my age. Prostitutes are women, like you said, who mark our lives by the scars on our bodies. All day I've been thinking of that time, remembering being that young, that tired, that angry, that scared, that lonely. Thinking about power and about lacking it. Too many cities, too many tricks. No woman to love me back to life then. So tomorrow, more stories, more talk with women and men like myself who remind me how I got here. The remembering is hard, hard and good. Part of this letter became the opening of her a glorious memoir, My Dangerous Desires, A Queer Girl Dreaming Her Way Home, um, which became an award-winning book. Um, 
she asked me to work as her editor on the book, which I did, and I can tell you that Amber wrote as she thought quite brilliantly. Her thinking was not linear, and her thought process itself was very speedy, yet complex and intricate. However, <laughs> sometimes her writing came as fast and furious as her thoughts did, as her life did, as if to accomplish so much urgently in a limited period of time, all in one long run-on sentence. And I can honestly say that I did not change a single word she wrote, but I did say to her, you know, darling, there's actually a place in the English language for the occasional comma <laughs> or period or even the occasional paragraph, <laughs> except when it came to her description of herself as a lesbian sex radical incest survivor, rural gypsy, poor white trash, high femme dyke, I said, hmm, for that you can leave out all the commas. <laughs> uh, when preparing for a speech or presentation, Amber was the great prevaricator. She'd have many meltdowns beforehand. I don't know what to do, she'd cry. Oh, baby, I'd say, don't worry, you got this. I remember her making notes furiously, all of which would wind up on multiple pads of lined paper, comprehensible only to her. But then, ah, uh, during a presentation, often in front of large and intimidating audiences, there would be a moment when she would push the notes aside and just extemporaneously, off the top of her head, but on topic, with shocking clarity, and with such charisma. What a gift. Uh, Amber spent most of her last 40 plus years here in New York. During that time, in addition to her many jobs at GMHC, the task force SAGE and QEJ, to name a few, um, she became an award-winning filmmaker, The Heart of the Matter, co-produced by Ginny Redica, who I think is here today. Uh, but she was a California girl before she was ever a New Yorker. Um, and her childhood there, her time as a young woman also in San Francisco, where she hit her stride politically and found her voice as a public speaker shaped her forever. She was born into um, the trailer parks and growing valleys of uh, Central California near Bakersfield, Oildale, Carmichael. She was a survivor of incest and violence, and early on she understood an important thing about family, especially about some of the horrors and glories of the nuclear family. Um, the people who hurt and violate us the most are often the people we love the most and who, um, in their terrible, complex, messy, flawed, human ways, might also love us deeply, or at least try. Her parents were smart, and they gave her brains, and as E.G. mentioned, a gift of the gab, uh, both of which came in very handy throughout her life. Um, they put her on their motorcycles and gave her a taste for speed that never left her. She was a stock car trophy girl at 12. She left home while still in her teens, hitchhiked across the country. She survived by working as a prostitute at truck stops, picking tobacco, cleaning motel rooms, working the nighttime counters at donut shops. For a while, she had a gig as a stripper in Las Vegas, and the money was great. And she realized this and other work in the sex trades sometimes made real economic sense, not just for her, but for a lot of women, a lot of queers. And I, I've never been a sex worker myself, but I've spent hours in the dirt picking sugar beets. I've done factory work. I've waited tables, tended bar, suffered the humiliations, large and small, that are inflicted every day upon people doing physical work. And I can tell you, that shit does not make economic sense. Yeah. 
Amber joined the civil rights movement. She studied Marxism by day. She moved around, finally settling in San Francisco where she worked at Modern Times Bookstore, joined the women's movement, and also joined a gay socialist group. She was the only woman in it, supporting a mayoral candidate named Harvey Milk. And by the way, her speech uh, in 1979 in front of the angry, anguished gay crowd after the Dan White verdict with John D'Amelio has, has elaborated on very eloquently, in which Laura Flanders has also brought up in her, her eloquent eulogy to Amber. Um, she aroused gay people to protest powerfully, not on a university campus, not in their own neighborhoods, but right in the heart of the city's political center, where they attacked and set fire to the property and machinery of power. This became known as the White Knight Riots. It was an important event in the history of the gay liberation movement. And I'm saying gay liberation, not gay pride. I mean, pride is cool. Don't get me wrong. It's nice to have a parade and to be sort of accepted in some way and to feel really good about ourselves and for corporations to give us money. <laughs> Liberation, though, is a whole different animal. And things changed for her very quickly after that. In 1980, she and Sheree Moraga uh, wrote and published the essay, What We're Rolling Around in Bed With. Uh, in which they had a remarkably frank discussion of butch femme roles and lesbian sexual practice. And this gave her a kind of notoriety, uh, making her famous in some feminist circles and infamous in others. Amber was a passionate feminist, uh, but she would learn the darker side of sisterhood. During a 1982 conference held at Barnard College, um, at which she was scheduled to speak. It was called The Scholar and the Feminist Nine Towards the Politics of Sexuality, which uh, soon became known simply as the Sex Wars Conference. Uh, she and other lesbians, among them Gail Rubin, Dorothy Allison, Joan Nessel, Esther Newton. Hey, Esther, did you get picketed? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, they were picketed by anti-porn feminists. And for the first time in her life, Amber crossed a picket line <laughs> and gave a great talk. And her insistence uh, that so sexual desires is powerful a force as revolution, that in fact it is essential to revolution, turned academic feminism on its head and continues to do so today. Uh, People in political meetings and in some of the organizations she worked for would sometimes roll their eyes, I think, when Amber was in a meeting, when she started to talk about sexual desire. And you could hear them thinking, why was she always talking about that? Um, I'll tell you what I think, why it was and is so important. Our bodies and our minds are just normally wired for ecstasy. And people will give up anything, anything, to experience that. Now, in the nation state, citizens and others will tolerate a whole lot of suffering and privation. They'll tolerate a lot of bullshit. They'll tolerate a lot of lies. The economy is booming. Unemployment is at a record low. The war is going so well. Now everyone can get married. <laughs> Big brother loves you. But a personal hint that ecstasy exists and all the lies start to fall apart. You may be walking through the gray little universe of a titularly democratic plutocracy, perhaps. You sound familiar? Um, or of an openly authoritarian fascist state on your way to your gray little joyless job that produces nothing of value except a gray little paycheck. When a look of desire from someone passing by can shake your world and you think, I want you. 
It's a little whisper that breaks through the background cacophony of bullshit. And it starts to tear down all the lies. Or as, as George Orwell wrote in 1984, say, a tiny note is passed to you just outside the perimeter of the surveillance cameras. And you open the note and see these words, I love you. And that little phrase cuts through all lies and the bullshit begins to fall away. Why? Because you experience desire. You want fulfillment and ecstasy and love. And to have that, you're willing to go for broke. And then you begin to allow yourself other desires. You want the powers that be to tell you what the fuck is going on. You want the truth. And maybe you even dare to start speaking truth in the light of day. You want what is right, what gives you promise. As Amber articulated in her interview with Laura Flanders, you want an engagement with the future, with a different, better, more just future, a future that holds the promise of ecstasy. In other words, you want liberation. And that is a direct threat to the nation state. As any spy setting up a honey trap will tell you, sometimes one person's desire can destabilize nations. That's why she insisted that any viable political movement has to recognize the centrality of human desire, that the capacity for ecstasy that is wired within our bodies the pleasure seeking between human beings that leads to delight, to connection, that spawns the possibility of love and of hope, constitutes a threat to fascism and creates the possibility of revolutionary social change. Amber believed this and she expounced it all her life. And people always said, oh, she's larger than life. But that is a mistake. I believe she was as large as life should be. And she was as large as life could be for all of us. She didn't want to settle for something small when what she wanted was something big, when what she wanted was everything for everybody, everything differently. What was also true about her in intimate terms was her profound tenderness. She was a singularly tender lover and partner and friend. This tenderness was something she expressed all the time in ways too many to enumerate. I, I remember a very gentle hand on my shoulder when I was in my office working hard and having no success, a feeling beaten down, worn out, and her voice was suddenly there in my ear. Jen, it's three in the morning. It's time to come eat dinner. She had prepared this dinner for me, and she'd waited up to make sure I would eat it. She was capable of absolute commitment. She possessed profound wisdom um, and gave me an irreplaceable friendship. And in all this, I have to say that I found her infinitely womanly. She really was everything a woman could be to me, and, and we were lovers in every sense of the term for 26 years. Um, it was one of the greatest strokes of luck in my life to have this, and it was the honor of my life to protect it. 
Um, I, I did protect it fiercely and sometimes with a little edge of jealousy, you know. Um, <laughs> for example, I always had flowers sent to her the day before Valentine's Day. And when she asked me why, I said, well, I want to be the first in line, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's a dirty, competitive world out there. <laughs> she laughed. But she did have plenty of admirers. Um, I met her at her place of work once on Valentine's Day. Um, and as I approached her desk, I saw that the flowers I'd sent her the day before were sitting there. Um, but so were a lot of other bouquets and flowers <laughs> that others had sent on Valentine's Day. And when she saw me, though, she stood and gave the gorgeous grin that only she could give, a combination of joy, flirtatiousness, and a little goofiness. You're right, she said. You were the first in line. <laughs> and she gathered up all the flowers everyone else had sent her and threw them in the trash on our way out. <laughs> Babe, I said, you got that one right. <laughs> but, <laughs> as you may intuit, living with a lesbian, sex radical, ex-hooker, incest survivor, rurally gypsy, poor white trash, high femme dyke wasn't always an easy lift. <laughs> She was a ferocious woman. She met you dead on. She brooked no bullshit. But she could also be an extremely difficult woman, very demanding. Uh, she was trouble coming at, straight at you, and she was utterly infuriating at times. Marxist though she was, Amber was um, very particular about some expensive things. Good food, for example, good cooking equipment, she loved to cook. She loved fine restaurants that broke the bank. And yes, she made an unforgettable fish vindaloo. Also, she was quite particular about her makeup. Once we were getting ready to go to an event at which she was to appear on stage as part of a Q&A panel. The time was late, um, and she had yet to get dressed. Honey, I said. Don't you think you ought to get dressed? There's plenty of time. But our friends were on the way in their car to pick us up. Well, I said, not really. She muttered under her breath, but proceeded to get dressed. Then she started putting on her makeup. By this time, our friends had arrived and pulled their car up outside. Honey, I said, they're here. Fine, she said. Does that mean fine, you're ready, or just fine? <laughs> she turned away from the mirror, fire shooting from her eyes. No one is going to tell me how long I can spend putting on my makeup. <laughs> Amber, I said, we got to leave soon. Then you go. Just go. I'll call, call a car and I will get there on my own. By this time, I was pissed off. OK, I said, if you want to, you can do that. I'm going to wait outside for five minutes. Just let me know what you decide. I step outside, Donna's there leaning against the car, Kathleen's inside the car staring into the rear view mirror, and she's putting on mascara. Huh, Donna said, what's up? I want a divorce, I said. <laughs> huh, something happened? <laughs> yeah, I said, she's putting on her makeup. Oh yeah, says Donna, I hate it when they do that. Two, two minutes later, the door to our place opens and Amber storms out, looking exquisite. She glares at me. I open the car door for her. We all get in and drive away. We arrive at the venue, almost on time, not talking to each other, and manage to get ourselves in, and I get her seated. But I turn around and Mary Ellen is racing towards me with her hands in the air. Have you seen Julie? 
No, I say, what happened to Julie? I don't know. We left the house and got here, and she said she realized she'd left her lipstick at home. <laughs> so <laughs> she ran out a while ago to buy some lipstick, but I, <laughs> but, but I haven't seen her since. <laughs> Let me tell you, if, if there's a special place in hell for butches, this was it. <laughs> um, the event went off pretty much as planned. Amber got up on the stage for the Q&A, and as usual, she was brilliant, perceptive, and eloquent. Um, riding back in the car uh, with Don and Kathleen, we were in a better mood, but all was still not really okay. I could see it in her physical pose. You could see it in her eyes. And I was really sore, too. Can I have a divorce, I finally asked. <laughs> no, she said, I won't give you one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we had problems, troubles, difficult times, like everyone else who lives hard and long together. But I adored her. I adored her. Everybody knows the crisp little phrase that Marx wrote, religion is the opium of the people. What many don't know is the profoundly humane phrase that accompanies it. It is the heart in a heartless world. Marx, too, understood the power, the centrality of ecstasy in the human experience. He pinpointed the source as religion. Amber insisted on the centrality of sexual desire, of human eros, as the source of ecstasy, the heart in a heartless world. In ways too vast and too intimate, uh, to give voice to, she was so often my heart in a heartless world. Amber didn't let darkness govern her relationships. She didn't let the price of her past, her childhood, her sexual history, all the hard things she'd been through compromise her love for people. For all of you, or her love for our children, or for me. I always said there was something in her that refused to accept winter. My California girl. As Joanne Vipievsky wrote of her in The Nation, she let the light in. Uh, the loss of her leaves a, a permanent emptiness in my arms, in my bed, and in my spirit. Yet, the memory of her is astonishingly sweet. When he learned of uh, Amber's death, a dear friend of mine, David Horst, uh, said to me, we're all just walking each other home. And I think in some way, when we love each other, that's true. So um, I thank you for being here. Thank you for helping me walk my California girl home. Thank you. Thank you.